Stem cell treatment is really big right now. And no doubt about it, stem cell treatment is a massive influx of stem cells that nothing you do naturally could touch. Like you can't compete with that. But there's a lot of people that want to increase their stem cells without going to get treatment. So let's talk about five ways that you can potentially do this. Some of the stuff I'm gonna talk about today is in vitro stuff. So we can't take it to the bank, but it's still interesting nonetheless. And there are things that you can apply to your life that regardless of whether you get a stem cell effect or not, are still tremendous for a healthy lifestyle. So either way, there are things that you could implement. The fact that you get a potential stem cell effect and more stem cell colonization and differentiation, that's just a bonus. So stem cells can be produced, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to, let's say, well, differentiate or commit to becoming a cell, becoming the full grown mature cell. That comes with a healthy lifestyle. Even if someone were to go get a stem cell injection or a stem cell treatment, a healthy lifestyle would still be imperative for those stem cells to take. They're fragile, right? So with all that being said, let's jump into the first one. But first, after today's video, I put a link down below for 50% off Haya multivitamins. Now, if you have kids like I do, you're probably looking for a way to get a little bit more nutrition in their diet. I always am. At the end of the day though, my kids love taking a Haya multivitamin because it's sweetened with monk fruit. So I'm not opposed to it. There's no sugar in it. Plus, they enjoy it. It's a fun ritual that I like to be a part of. It's a lot of fun for them to be able to say, hey, I got my pajamas on, now I can go have my vitamin. And to them, it's a treat, but they're not having to get the garbage like Flintstone vitamins and stuff like that that are riddled with sugar and red dye 40 that I had to have when I was a kid. These are a completely different ball game. So that is a 50% off huge discount link for you to check them out. A big thank you to Haya for the support on this channel. So top line of the description underneath this video. Okay, the first way that you can increase potentially stem cells is by fasting. And I know you wanna turn off this video because you're like, oh, we, here we go, fasting nonsense. No, this stuff's legit. Look at fasting works from a caloric deficit perspective, but there's also a lot of evidence in other areas too. This study was published in stem cells and it took a look at phase one human clinical trial as well as mice. And it was looking at, in this case, chemotherapy patients because fasting was a part of their chemotherapy regimen. It was fasting in adjunct to chemotherapy. What they found is that when they had these subjects fast, it would decrease their white blood cell count. And that's normal during a fast. The white blood cells will typically migrate back into the marrow. But after the fast, there was a significant increase in what are called hematopoietic stem cells. So these are the stem cells that are later on going to become blood or immune cells. This is really interesting, and this isn't the first time we've seen this. I've seen this in other fasting literature before, that there is an interesting effect on stem cells, specifically blood and immune stem cells. Now, why is it doing this? Well, it seems to be doing this because of a reduction in protein kinase A. For stem cells, particularly hematopoietic stem cells to be released, you need to have a decrease in PKA, okay, protein kinase A. Now, without getting into mechanistic gobbledygook, basically what that means is the Stem cells or the blood cells go and they rehome back in the marrow and they get stronger. And when they get stronger, not only do the white blood cells release and come back stronger, but you have some stem cells that come out too and potentially create more and potentiate a stronger activity with the blood and immune system. Okay, next up, there is a study that took a look at shorter term fasting inducing ketosis. What they found in this study is that fasting until you just got to the point where you were producing ketones created a quote, deep quiescent state in muscle stem cells. What that basically means is these muscle stem cells ended up having more potential to survive under stress. So during the fast, they were less poised to activate, but after the fast, they had more survivability. They basically became stronger just like any kind of adaptation with anything. It's like if you exercise, during exercise, you're actually less resilient because you're exercising and you have a lot of stress on you, but afterwards you adapt. It seems like similar things happen with our stem cells. Next up is sauna. And there was a study published in Research in Complementary Medicine that was really interesting. It took a look at a Finnish sauna and it had subjects go in a sauna for just 10 minutes three times at 90 degrees Celsius. So pretty hot, but not ridiculously hot. They found with this, after the sauna sessions, there was a moderate increase in marrow-derived endothelial stem cells. So these are stem cells that might help with blood vessel formation and things like that. This is after pretty short stents. 
And again, it comes back to similar things as with fasting. It's probably a stress response where the body says, uh-oh, we need to adapt, we need to grow, we might need to create vasculature, we might need to create new blood vessels. To do that, you would have to potentiate some stem cells. There was also some small evidence that it increased the ability for these stem cells to colonize, which means may have helped them go to the right place. This is all really early research, so we cannot 100% take this to the bank, but it's still fascinating between fasting and sauna. There was another study published in the American Journal of Cardiology had subjects use a sauna five times per week for three weeks. And the same sort of thing. They saw an increase in CD34, which is basically a marker for an increase in what are called lymphohematopoietic stem cells. Once again, hematopoietic stem cells that are more associated with the lymphatic system. Way too early to tell and candidly goes beyond my pay grade when we start talking about the lymphatic system a little bit, but it seems as though fasting and sauna are quite powerful. But what's the third thing that we can do? This is where we get a little more specific. There's literature on what is called Norwegian 4x4 training. It is gruesome, it is not fun, but is one of the best ways to also improve your VO2 max. So, so far, I have not told you to drink rhinoceros urine. I have not told you to harvest the toenail clippings of a rhesus monkey. I have not told you to go shave your neighbor's dog and brew it into a tea. I'm not telling you to do weird things. I'm telling you to do things that are also pretty good for your health. And if you have a problem with doing the occasional fast or the occasional sauna, it's no harm, no foul either. But Norwegian 4x4 is where you run for four minutes or you exercise intensely for four minutes, like cardio, three minute rest, four minutes on, three minute rest, and you do that four times, four by four. Hugely beneficial for building stamina and VO2 max. Just so happens to trigger a potential increase in stem cells. In this study, they saw there was a high degree of oxidative stress. No surprise, it's a very stressful workout. But afterwards, they saw a significant increase in, you guessed it, once again, hematopoietic stem cells probably a pretty significant adaptation to the large amount of stress that you just went through. Interesting. Fasting is somewhat of an exercise mimetic in many ways. Sauna is definitely an exercise mimetic. You're basically mimicking the effects of exercise by sitting in a high heat sauna. Huh, it's no surprise that intense exercise is actually driving up stem cells too. What's interesting is that the more trained the people were that did this, the more conditioned they were, the more it protected what is called clonogenicity. This means that it protects the ability for those stem cells to reproduce and clone in a safe and productive way. Basically, so you're producing stem cells at a more rapid rate and cloning them at a safer, rapid rate without dysfunction. So the more that you do this kind of thing and the more that you become trained, the more efficient and safe the stem cell proliferation would be in theory. This next one I'm just gonna to touch on for a little bit because it's so in vitro that I can't comfortably say this is 100% gonna do things. But there is in vitro evidence that when you reduce your sugar intake and your blood sugar is lower, it increases the survivability of stem cells. So in this case, we're talking specifically about mesenchymal stem cells. These again have to do with the lymph, they have to do with blood vessel formation to a certain degree, possibly soft tissue formation. So it would make sense, once again, I mean, when you're saturating your body with high levels of glucose, it's probably not good. But again, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this one because it's still early on, but once again, I don't think any harm could come from reducing your blood sugar a little bit. This next one is vitamin D. Very interesting research that came out of the Journal of Ovarian Research. In this particular case, they were looking at cancer cells and human stem cells. And what they saw is that when treated with vitamin D, it actually increased the survivability of the human stem cells while inhibiting the growth of the cancer cells. Okay, if this is happening in a Petri dish, cancer is way too complex to take out of that context and apply it to a human body with everything moving. But there's some other literature that suggests that vitamin D could really be good for stem cells. That was just sort of the opening act. This study was published in Stem Cells International. What this study found is that vitamin D increased what is called osteogenic stem cell differentiation. That is scientific jargon for these premature sort of bone stem cells had a stronger commitment to finally become actual bone cells. Remember how I mentioned that you can have an increase in stem cells, but if you're unhealthy, 
those stem cells may not actually commit. They can't actually turn into what they're supposed to turn into. Think of them as little baby stem cells. And if you don't take care of these babies, you don't nurture these babies, and they don't have a healthy environment, they can't grow up to be adults. So these stem cells can't turn into what they need to turn into. It seems as though vitamin D and adequate amounts of sunlight and getting vitamin D in can increase the commitment, the osteogenic differentiation. So these stem cells can actually become bone. Hugely important as we get older. So it's not that vitamin D is just directly helping calcium get where it needs to go and yada yada. It seems like there's a direct effect with vitamin D and actually allowing bone cells to form and bone to form. This is exponentially important as we get over the age of 40 and we start losing bone mass and bone density. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.